Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Duke Oishi. In our show tonight, we'll talk about housing in Hawaii. What's holding it up? Indeed, housing is one of Hawaii's toughest problems. Yes, we'll examine some of the issues raised at the Housing in Hawaii conference we recently did with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and Pacific New Media at the Plaza Club. To build a better economy, our workforce needs to have reasonable housing at reasonable prices. From homelessness to lack of affordable housing, housing in Hawaii is in trouble. We'd like to drill down on planning and construction, environment and land use, transportation, engineering, energy, architecture, community development, pricing, marketing and financing to provide housing that will work for Hawaii's future. We started off that day with a wake-up keynote by local developer Christine Camp on what's wrong with this picture. I saw one of the saddest scenes that I've seen in Hawaii in 35 years that I've been here. Dozens, and I, I don't kid you, dozens of tents. It's as if I had entered a third world country. I recognized one of the guys who was standing out there, but I recognize him because he's a car washer at one of the local car wash places. And so I've seen him regularly. Here's a guy who's working. There he is, living in a tarp. All right, there may be over 13,000 homeless people here in Hawaii. It would take three firemen or three teachers or five hotel front desk clerks to afford the mortgage of a uh, medium priced home. With statistics like that, it really shows that the middle class dream of home ownership here is eluding the middle class. Instead of providing more forms for having market-based homes that can be priced for the middle income, we've actually made it more expensive. And this is in contrast to those, what I consider to be the golden years, where massive housing developments were um, done in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But we don't have that anymore. We don't have a lot of entrepreneurs out there because it's become so risky. The state and county government have tended to use exactions to require developers to build certain percentage of affordable housing in exchange for zoning approvals. This policy has made only the market housing more expensive and affordable housing more elusive. The cost of affordable housing is being borne by those who are buying the market price homes. Is that good public policy? Government should be assisting instead of adding more burden. You get the point that the building codes that are meant to save people and save lives perhaps has, is one of the reasons why we, have, we see so many tarps out there. We are at a crisis. Maybe we need to take a holiday from all of these codes and go back to the basic codes that we were facing back in 1960s and 70s. But let's look at what we're trying to solve here again. What's the problem? It's basic housing for the masses. We've been talking about regulatory reform for I don't know how long. But it is something that somebody really needs to look at again with the focus of providing affordable housing. Maybe the state with all their land ownership, if they ceded land and they can't sell it, let's lease it. Let's lease it for affordable housing. The regulators and the people in uh, policy still believe they're doing a favor to the, to the developers and still putting in obstacles. Then we had four blue ribbon panels. The first was called Facing the Constraints. The moderator was Steve Petrenik of Hawaii Business Magazine, sponsor of the program. I got a call from a, a lawyer from Texas a few years ago uh, telling me that her, her uh, client had just purchased uh, a parcel of property on one of the neighbor islands in the coastal area. And uh, it went something like this, uh, David, I understand you know something about land use law and why, and I'd like you to give me some idea about what, what it's going to take uh, to do this. In, in Texas, uh, it would take about 60 days to six months. I took a deep breath and started in on, on uh, what we had, and about halfway through, she said, thank you, David, I don't think we'll exercise our option. Uh, because there were just too many controls, too many regulations. So uh, call them what you like, environment, land use, permits, reviews, plans, all of them individually have, have some good points to them. But as a whole, they built up a system where it's virtually impossible to commence any kind of project with a greenfield site. Uh, which is where most of ours start. And so my first suggestion is that uh, we, we begin uh, by starting with, for, for low-income housing, for affordable housing at least, with zero regulations. So our housing unit increases is roughly proportional to the number of people that we've increased by. But what I would suppose uh, suggest is that the type of housing we built is the wrong type of housing. Over the same period, 
uh, the average median price, uh, that's redundancy, the median price of housing nearly doubled. We went from roughly a price about $280,000 to somewhere around 580000 It fluctuates. I think it went down a little bit uh, last year. So the type of housing we're building isn't the type of housing that allows people to go in and buy these houses and move in kind of the way we want. And so we need to really look at trying to develop greener housing, denser, uh, more centrally urban located housing, um, and uh, making sure that these types of houses that we build are affordable. Uh, I would end on the note of right now, I don't believe the private industry can build those type of units on an economic basis. You have to have exemptions from the regulatory controls in order to be able to accomplish anything in the state of Hawaii. The regulatory process is simply too complex and too duplicative. Our legislature, in its wisdom, in 1961, gave the Board of Land and Natural Resources the right to move in and declare an area for development that is completely exempt from county rules. Why haven't we exercised those authorities? What did Governor Abercrombie do after the tsunami? He declared an executive order that allows for the reconstruction of the damaged areas. It waives the restrictions from every single development permit from A to Z. That's how you get the job done. Uh, many of you will know that the current state of our housing authority is that there are over 8,000 people on the wait list. There are those who are on the streets because they can't go into public housing. And there are those in public housing that can't move out of public housing because there is this gap. This gap that I'm talking about is low-income affordable housing that is available for working families. There is um, a lot of regulatory problems in the process. It's been a, a challenge for many, many years. But recently, through the organizing efforts, we were able to win a campaign, uh, an ap a campaign to build, um, to create the Office of Housing, just recently in the city. And what we asked is that in, within the mayor's office, that an actual person would be able to be responsible to move affordable housing documents between the different departments within the city. They also believe so strongly on transit-oriented development. Here is an example. The condo is $850,000. Transitory-oriented development and affordable housing are complete opposites, and this nice place is paying $150 a year in taxes. That's with all the breaks and all. Who pays the difference? All the rest of the people there. And we keep publicly and collectively shooting ourselves on the foot. There is a bright future, but we really have to change our mon modus operandi and how we do business. <laughs> Then we went to the second panel called Draining the Swamp. The moderator was Howard Dykus of Hawaii News Now. From my point of view, the quickest, fastest thing, and I think everyone here will probably agree, is construction. Ho I'm hoping that soon, sooner rather than later, Honolulu is going to be the Geneva of the Pacific, where we can actually have um, more than just APEC here for one day, that it'll be the center of diplomatic affairs for years to come. And if we really want to create that atmosphere of an international city, then we have to build it. Sprawl is so expensive. I think everyone here realizes that we can't afford to constantly grow our government infrastructure and government services. So we have to be more efficient. And vertical development is the one way that we can get it going. And here comes Linda Lingle and the Lingle administration in the 1990s uh, and into the 2000s. The shift was slow. At the beginning, affordable housing was not a real emphasis. But during her second term, she started to focus on affordable housing and asking the question, why wasn't more housing being built in all the islands? What was the problem? Well, it is because we don't have a uniform affordable housing policy in this state, number one. And number two, we haven't really answered the question, whose responsibility is it? to provide affordable housing for our community. Is it the private sector? Is it the government? Is it our citizens through taxes and other kinds of situations? Affordable housing is really kind of at a crossroads right now, as I see it. It really depends on our legislature and our governor and our people to determine a more unified and more definitive policy on affordable housing in order to produce more units for our community. So I would like to see people talk about opportunity housing and changing the mindset from 
a handout, give me a handout, to a hand up. Did you guys realize we can't even bring in modular housing from California, Oregon, Washington? There's a law in the books that says it has to be certified or overseen by a licensed electrical or plumbing contractor. One of the concepts where I got started in real estate development was rent to own. I went out and bought a bunch of houses and then I, 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 I rented them and I gave people a rent credit on the house and I became their partner. I owned it, they rented it, I gave them a monthly uh, credit equity. The banks found that appealing that these people could make these rent payments. This is where I hear a lot of opposition from the other side uh, from developers is that if we give you these waivers, we give you this benefit, we give you this, we gi we're giving you this, this ability, who says that you're not going to take and you're not going to make astronomical returns? And I think that's a big challenge and I think that's something that you can't ever answer. Did some stuff in Boston, did some stuff in Philadelphia. Those cities put shivers down the spine of developers. Um, our process here is tougher. So, you know, when the earlier panel was talking about uh, Hawaii, um, I can tell you uh, with great authority, having done quite a bit in very difficult cities, um, the two most difficult cities on the East Coast, uh, Hawaii is tougher. So, you know, we have a process here that, that is very difficult, um, that does uh, slow things down, that, that, that is challenging, and that results in a lack of affordable housing. The third panel was called Shaping the Hood, referring to neighborhoods, of course. The moderator was Alan Yonin of the Star Advertiser. The state of Hawaii projects that we'll have 1.6 million people living here by 2030. That's 300,000 more that, than counted last year in the U.S. Census. This means that we're going to need to provide about 100,000 new homes, more than 100,000 new homes statewide. We really do need to evaluate product mix and densities, but in realistic time-sensitive, and community-specific context. The PUC has been successful with um, high-rise development, but it's largely um, the prime market areas that we've picked off so far and the, those that have been facilitated by HCDA. Though we'd like to see more of the housing accommodated in this area for sustainability, design, and other reasons, um, as a practical matter, outside of Kakaako, the PUC is going to be important but it will not be sufficient to address the great housing needs we're facing. Successful introduction of multifamily living on the outlying areas in the neighbor islands um, has a great ways to go. I'm, I'm the oddball. I'm the one person who believes affordable housing can be built. It's easy to build. It can be done. All you got to do is give me the money. I'll do it. I have no problem with it. When I grew up in Honolulu, the city ended at Kalihi. And after Kalihi was sugarcane and then villages. There was Aiea, there was Pearl City, there was Waipahu, there was Wahiwa. It was really a very nice community. The highest building was six, seven stories. Today you hear us say constantly, and people tell us constantly, Honolulu or Oahu is one of the best cities in the country. And the reality is, are we really that good, or is everyone else so bad, <laughs> we're just a little bit better? We need to go back to building large centers of population surrounded by open space. Imagine 10,000 homes being demolished and replaced with high-rise buildings, but now you have open space of a mile or two miles around it, and you have a concentration. You have less sewer lines, less streets, less everything. It's more efficient, it's e cost economic, it's more economical, and it actually allows us to provide the affordable housing and everything we need, but preserve the uniqueness of what makes Hawaii, Hawaii. You know, the other challenge that I think comes with this urban desire to put everything in an urban environment. I mean, and that's an important form of housing, and we're not saying that that's not something that should be a focus of the public debate. But there are limitations. We have the, uh, the, the ability and the, and the benefit of having large land holdings where we can develop the types of amenities that we think are important for our lifestyle segments. Within the balance of the urban community, albeit with the exception of maybe Howard Hughes Corporation and a few others, nobody has that land mass to do it. So what you're left with is single projects 
that maybe have amenities, but not really neighborhoods and not really communities. And that's a big difference. If you want to bring people back into vibrant, desirable, livable communities, you're going to have to solve that particular issue. Otherwise, you're just going to have a confederation of projects which may or may not link together. And you don't have a neighborhood. You don't have a community. You have four walls with amenities. Fast forward to the subject, the opportunity, if you will, that transit is coming. Transit will have 21 stations. Each of them I see as an opportunity for a different kind of neighborhood to be created. There will not be a one-size-fits-all. There should not be a one-size-fits-all. But is, it is our opportunity uh, of a, as a community to start saying, what are the living units? How are they going to exist in a neighborhood and in a community? And that's really how we can move forward on some of these subjects, such as affordable housing. We have to um, abolish the Department of Planning and Permitting and reformat it so that the planning function is seen as being organized around neighborhoods, enabling in neighborhoods, and letting things happen in neighborhoods, and that the regulatory function, as many others have said, can be reevaluated so that it is structured towards helping create both the units and the um, neighborhoods that we would be seeking. After lunch, we wound up with a blockbuster fourth panel entitled, What If We Do Nothing? The moderator was Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. And every state should have an interagency council. And our state, we intend to make it the best interagency council that exists. It focuses on collaboration, on teamwork, on partnerships, public and private. It focuses on us being truly unified as a community in addressing homelessness. So that's another element of action that's coming up. And I think it's really important because they will develop the 10-year plan that will eliminate homelessness. Other actions, focusing on housing first. We gotta house people. We, that is a proven way of dealing with homelessness. Even when people have drug issues, alcohol issues, mental health issues, when we provide stable housing, we reduce crime in the area, and we benefit the homeless person themselves. Permanent housing with supportive services. Again, these are best practices, data-based services that actually deliver on the results. Our cure, I believe, lies in the journey a family makes from being one that can't afford a home to one that can afford a home. And a case in point for us was our home ownership assistance program. We had 2,000 families in this program. We estimate that 1,000 of those families were receiving a minimum of $1,000 per month of some type of government assistance, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, or some other type of nonprofit assistance. 1,000 families, $1,000 a month for one year is $12 million of our families alone. If I get, or if we get, those 12, those 1,000 families into a home, we're saving our taxpayers $12 million. So what we learned was, when I, when I just asked people, what is this permit process? Planning, public works, Department of Environmental Management, fire, even if it's on Stonewall, um, Department of Health, right? State agency, and you find out one person takes five minute plan review, the next person takes six minutes, another person takes three minutes. But it takes six to eight weeks for get from you to you, takes another eight to 12 weeks for get to one department to the next. You get bounced, Lord forbid, you're back at the beginning again. Yep. Then we find out this thing takes six months to a year. So I said, hey, why? How come all you guys not just sit in the same room at the same time once a week? So we did that. And uh, <laughs> what we learned was we started this program at the end of November, and we put everybody in a room, Hilo and Kona, once a week, and really thankful to the Department of Health, no jurisdiction authority over them. But they said, shoot, we can play. Get some hassle and headache off of my desk. So they come every week. And we took over 100 permits, commercial so far, test pilot, and we're going to move it to residential because, hey, these are where people work, and this is where money flowing, and we've got to do everything we can to expedite and facilitate that. And then what happened with over 100 in one month, they got their permits moving. So any of you thinking investing, Big Island, place to go. No, 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 no. So barriers and hurdles, right? You got to take care of that. In a rural community, when you're looking at having to put in the infrastructure for a subdivision that had never been finished, as we did on a house um, that we, we were able to build last year, um, 
the cost to put in that infrastructure just for electrical was going to run about thirty thousand dollars and that was before Miko would even come out and look at actually giving us a bid for putting in an electrical pole about 800 feet so <clears throat> So, but we're talking about solutions, but what we decided to do was to turn the problem into the solution. So instead of saying, oh, well, that's it, we're not going to be able to build this home for this very deserving family who had waited 20 years to build their house on DHHL land, and they finally got the opportunity with um, Habitat for Humanity, um, we decided to take them off the grid, which was a lot. <laughs> And, but, but I decided if it was already going to cost $30,000, then we needed to go the extra mile. And, um, and we got a, a great grant from uh, Nahazda, DHHL, for energy upgrades. So we were able to subsidize the cost. And we were able to give this family who, on Molokai, I'm sure you're all aware that Hawaii does pay the most for electric. Well, in Molokai, we pay the most next to Lanai. And so our family was paying about $500 a month in electric bill. So and that's just electric. We're trying to do the same with Coa Ridge, our next project. We've been at it only 12 years. We have another two years to go before we can start, if everything moves smoothly. Um, with all the exactions, with building the off-sites, not just the on-sites, not the housing, but just the legal fees, the time, the 12 years, and doing the sewer lines and dedicating them over, building the freeway improvements and highway improvements, doing the water system and giving that over. For the 3,500 homes we plan on building there, it's going to cost us $85,000 a unit. For Mililani, those same costs cost me $40,000 a unit. I heard earlier about, oh, solar is only $1,000, that's only $1,000, that's only $500. When you add it up, it's $85,000. Offsite should only be about 8% of your total cost. If I look at the median price of a home, which is $570,000, that $85,000 represents 15%. Oh, Lots of people ask what we're going to do to follow up on this program. But our follow up right now is just to bring you this OC16 video and to post the full proceedings on our website, thinktechhawaii.com. As always, we leave it to those who participated to remember what was said and hopefully to act on it. You can act on it too. It's not your own housing, you know, you should be concerned with. You're okay. It's the next guy. You should be concerned with his housing. Because if he's not in the house, if he goes homeless, if he has a problem, we lose him from the workforce. He's no longer productive. And in fact, he's a drain in our economy. And his family is a drain in our economy. So we're all better off if everybody has good housing. And now, here's our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. Next week on April 28th, ThinkTech, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, and Pacific New Media UH will present a luncheon program called Reciprocal Investments Between Hawaii and China. On May 26th, we'll present our annual legislative update reporting on developments in the 2011 legislative session. For further information or to reserve a seat at these programs, visit hvca.org or thinktechhawaii.com. 
And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. Well, I'm all excited about our joint program, uh, Reciprocal China Investment. Now, what does that mean? Well, we want to look at both sides of the coin. We're going to look at um, opportunities for people in Hawaii to invest in China, but also what's going on with China investing in Hawaii. So I think there are uh, opportunities on both sides, and we've got a, two great panels to really dig in and come up with some important facts for us all to know. So the two panels, I know that one is moderated by Roger Epstein of Cage Study Firm, and the other, uh, Li Feng Tao, who is a professor uh, in the uh, Shanghai uh, Foreign Trade uh, Institute, uh, and who is here at the LLM program at the UH Law School. A great group of people. It's going to be jam-packed, uh, but we're going to make sure they give us just the nuggets of gold that we need to get the insight. Yeah, you know, uh, it's one thing to uh, have somebody say, yes, it's good that we should do business in China. That's not what we're looking for. We want to find out exactly how it's good, in what sectors, and who to talk to, and how you effectuate it. We don't want to hear somebody say, there are problems and risks and dangers in doing business in China. No, we want to find out how you deal with those problems and risks. April 28th. April 28th. The 20th floor of the Pioneer Plaza Club. And we'll see you then. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Family Foundation. Jay Scheidler, through the Scheidler Family Foundation, supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Hawaiian Electric Company, Hiko and its affiliates Miko on Maui, and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company which has a large presence in and commitment to Hawaii. Oceanit, a local tech company, is one of Hawaii's largest and most diversified science and engineering companies. Okay, dude, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week, just like Duke does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. And for lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, Visit thinktechhawaii.com, be a sponsor, and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech. And I'm Duke Oishi. Aloha, everyone. And I'm Duke Oishi. Aloha, everyone.